thanks once again, all yours here. Okay, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. And also thank you for inviting me. It's a really exciting opportunity to share our work and ideas to uh, this uh, new audience. Uh, my work has always been nodding to the field of AI, uh, but working with colleagues who are really in the uh, centered in the CS AI community has been a more relatively recent thing. So it's a real honor to be visiting a place where so many advances in AI have been made and is one of the most exciting places to study this. So I'll, I'm just going to start with a pretty uncontroversial statement, which is that we learn from other people. Uh, we know more than what we can ever learn on our own because we learn from other people. And as a species, humans have evolved with other people and to be with other people. And we've survived and lived by competing with others like this and cooperating with others like this, uh, developing better ways to communicate with others, uh, well, for, for better or worse. Uh, and these social demands have really shaped our brains and shaped our minds. And as individuals, we're surrounded by other people, uh, by others from the moment that we're born. We observe what they do, we track others, we learn from them. And humans have even created all kinds of cultural institutions to promote and facilitate social learning from the way that we raise our children to how we scale that up to develop schools and educational systems. And we're uh, in one of those systems uh, at the moment. So it's clear we learn a lot. Uh, it's very important for us, and we're, but still we're pretty far from really understanding exactly what kinds of cognitive mechanisms allow us to uh, uh, demonstrate these rich, complex behaviors as learners and also as teachers and how they emerge and change in the earliest years of life. So uh, the question that we're asking in our lab is really how do we learn from others and what makes human social learning so distinctive, powerful, and smart? And how can we use these insights in order to build better AI systems is one of the messages I would like to communicate today. And one of the uh, interesting things is that humans are really far from the, uh, being the only species that engages in social learning. Many non-human animals learn from others by copying others and doing what others do. And this is not just chimpanzees or crows, uh, these uh, usual suspects in terms of the best social learning animals, uh, but even bees, uh, ants, and even fish, uh, they copy others for uh, better survival. And if you look at what humans do, uh, human children also imitate. So it's really tempting to think that these kinds of tendencies are really what's underlying human social learning too. And we seem to, uh, human children do seem to show uh, some really interesting, uh, seemingly uniquely human behaviors. For instance, if a child sees a person, uh, doing, uh, trying to open a box, but he does a lot of unnecessary things in the beginning, what children do is even though when it's very clear that those actions are unnecessary, the child will try to imitate the whole sequence of actions, seemingly irrational, uh, yet nonetheless, uh, these have been considered as one of the reasons why humans are so good at learning. You copy the entire sequence uh, you, and you uh, are more likely to learn adaptive behaviors that other people exhibit. And the ideas around imitation and learning from copying others' actions is also beginning to, uh, it's, well, it's, it's not a recent thing, but it's, um, especially relatively recently, it's been uh, recognized more and more in the AI uh, and robotics community. Uh, imitation learning is something that we often hear uh, from conferences and uh, some of you may be already be working on this too. Uh, Elvin uh, is one of those uh, systems that have been developed here at CMU. Well, so uh, this is what we usually think about what social learning is, that we observe and we do what others do. Uh, and uh, there is this uh, a set of intuitive beliefs that we hold about what it means for us to learn from others, that it involves some kind of special mechanisms uh, for these copying or imitation to occur. And it, it looks quite different from individual learning, such as exploration. And it must have evolved as a cheaper shortcut in order to reduce the costs of exploration and trial and error. And there may be some Q driven strategies for uh, copying and trusting even more selectively so that we're learning from or copying better sources of information. 
And another uh, widespread belief is that social learning is something passive, especially compared to something like exploration. Exploration is active, curiosity-driven, intrinsic motivation. Uh, and you might have already seen this movie many times, a child uh, or an infant uh, just going around their room for hours, just playing with things. And compared to this kind of learning, uh, this child over here seems to be doing something kind of cute, but at the same time, uh, pretty boring, which is just doing exactly what other people did. Well, so these beliefs that we learn from others by copying what others do, trusting what others say, accepting information from other people, uh, these are in, reflected not just in lay beliefs about social learning, but also in scientific theories of social learning, uh, again, as well as how social learning is implemented in AI and robotics. Now, what I'm going to say is that these intuitive beliefs are actually misconceptions about social learning. And to, uh, uh, to make this point, I'll just show you what a child just does when they're with other people. Here's a three-year-old. What is this? It's dark. What is it? This is a blanket. It's dark. What's a blanket? See that? Oh. All right, I'm going to give you a bunch of blankets to play with while I write something down, OK? So she tries for a while, but no, none of her blocks no, actually stick. Thank you. Thank you. wants to help her. So from just less than a minute of a child's play, you find a range of behaviors that clearly show some aspects of cognition that we care about. So she's observing other people, uh, what things are happening. There's visual, tactile, auditory perception. Uh, she figures out what these uh, observations mean. Uh, she clearly imitates uh, what the other person has done. She was sticking the blocks uh, to the board over there, just like what the demonstrator, the adult did. Uh, but she also generalizes what she learned. Uh, she observed just a few instances. She instant, instantaneously generalized that property to all the other objects, and she tested all of uh, most of those blocks. So she explores the world and tries novel interventions, especially when they don't work. So she starts to bang the blocks together. Uh, she's curious about why it's not working. She tries to explain away why this is not working. And she communicates all of her thoughts as she's uh, doing all of these actions. And when things seems to be not really working out, then she even optimizes and she, she, decided, she decides to do something else. So, how is this possible? Uh, we ask again, uh, instead of how we learn from others, maybe what should, we should be asking is uh, how we learn in social contexts. So in order to really understand uh, how humans learn in social contexts, maybe we should start uh, uh, going back to the drawing board and really think about how humans learn more generally in the first place. So think about this learner, uh, and the learner is in this physical world, and there's various objects around the child. Uh, there's this uh, green toy, a few uh, balls, and a uh, interesting looking, complex looking toy. And the learner might be thinking, hey, how does the world work? And tries a few different interventions and explore the world and learn something. So uh, the decades of developmental psychology and developmental cognitive science uh, has really uh, looked into how uh, the, into the infant's mind and young children's mind. And the idea that's uh, in the field at the moment is that humans have an intuitive internal model of the world. Uh, some of these faces may be familiar to you, uh, but the idea is that even infants have rich 
abstract causal representations. For instance, uh, infants have some sense of intuitive physics. Uh, this is work by Liz Belkin and others. Uh, and they draw in, uh, powerful inferences uh, over these abstract causal representations. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, work of Josh Tenenbaum and colleagues to try to really formalize a process by which we draw these inferences and beyond. And uh, even infants uh, learn from their active exploration. They engage in active hypothesis testing and they learn from observed evidence, uh, both from uh, what happens in the world and also what happens as a consequence of their own actions. So you may be familiar with this uh, analogy, child is a scientist. Uh, they're thinking about the world in much the same way as scientists trying to figure out how the world works. And more recently, there's this paper out uh, by uh, Josh Rule, uh, Josh Tenenbaum, and Stu Piantadosi on uh, thinking of the child as a hacker. Now, from this point of view, uh, and, uh, these abilities are really present early in life, and some of the work that I've done uh, in graduate school is also uh, uh, considered a part of this endeavor, trying to understand how young children learn in the earliest years of life. Um, however, while children can do all of these actions themselves and try to figure out how it works, their own actions are pretty noisy and sparse. They don't know anything about the world yet, so they're trying things out and some of those actions are useful, but others are not as useful. What humans do is that they're surrounded by other people and a lot of the times the useful data that they observe actually come from other people's interactions with the world. For instance, their interactions with these objects. So there's a person who could be uh, pressing this button on the toy to make it work, uh, tries these uh, few different toys, blue and yellow toys, and tries to show that they work or don't work, uh, or a person who uh, generates this really interesting squeak sound by working on a specific part of this toy. So the interesting thing about human actions is that they're performed for different reasons. And uh, a learner who understands this can draw different inferences depending on uh, how it's performed, why it's performed. Sometimes people may be doing things incidentally without a clear goal. Uh, still, it's some kind of piece of information for the learner and the learner can take that and use that for their learning. Sometimes actions are instrumental. Uh, there's a self-serving goal. Uh, the actor is not necessarily thinking about the learner, but they're doing something for their own purpose. Uh, however, other times there may be some instructional actions. There's a clear communicative uh, pro-social goal uh, that the uh, communicator or the actor has. And these actions are particularly useful for the learner to learn from. Uh, however, in order to distinguish between these different kinds of actions and take advantage of them, learners need a generative model of how other people think, plan, and act, because they need to look behind the actions and think about why the person did it and for what kind of reasons. And uh, unsurprisingly, uh, teachers also need a generative model of others, uh, of the learner, because the learner, uh, the teacher needs to understand what does the learner know? What does the learner not know? And what are the things that I can do in order to make learning happen for the other person? So the idea behind inferential social learning is that learners not, don't just learn from self-generated evidence or observed evidence from the physical world, but they also learn from evidence generated by other people. And to make this happen, uh, they need to think about the other minds. So learners have to interpret the data to figure out what the teacher is conveying and update their beliefs accordingly. Uh, and what teaching means is to select the data in a way that conveys, conveys what is maximally helpful for the learner to know. So there are some key, key hypotheses uh, that this picture uh, gives rise to. First, uh, even young learners should be able to distinguish different ways in which agents can generate evidence uh, and draw inferences accordingly. I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. And learners uh, can go beyond the observed data and draw stronger inferences given instructional demonstrations. So imagine uh, a person here and the person takes out three blue toys from a box uh, mix of many different balls uh, and squeezes that ball, it squeaks squeezes another time, it squeaks, 
uh, dozen another time. So there's three blue toys that has this interesting squeaking property. Now the learner's job is to uh, uh, figure out this new toy, yellow toy, uh, squeak two. And what I'll show you is a video of uh, what children do with this toy. Uh, uh, two different cases uh, that differs in terms of the box from which uh, these balls came from. So in one case, the person sampled these three blue toys from a box that looks like this, mostly blue, but only a few uh, are yellow. In the other case, the uh, ratio is reversed. So everything else is the same, but except for the ratio of the balls inside the box. And let me show you what these children do. So you can see that in the left, the child is squeezing the toy a number of times. We took the squeaking mechanism out so that children would uh, perseverate if they really think it's going to squeak and try to squeeze many times. Whereas the child on the, uh, on the right hand side uh, rarely squeezed the ball and just did other things with it. So what does this mean? Uh, what did, uh, why did the two children behave uh, very differently? In the first case scenario, uh, if three blue toys came from a box that looks like the one on the left, the sample is quite probable. It suggests that the person didn't have a specific goal uh, of selecting blue toys, but they just happened to select those, uh, uh, happened to uh, sample those three. Uh, so the selection of three blue toys is incidental and it says nothing really significant about the status of the yellow toys. So maybe yellow toys squeak too, they come from the same box. If they're not sure, why not try? But the story is very different in the other case on the right hand side. The sample is highly improbable and it strongly suggests that the person was engaging in a strong uh, or biased sampling, that her selection of three blue toys was clearly non-incidental. And why? Presumably because it's just the blue toys that squeak and yellow toys do not. So there's a simple Bayesian model uh, that uh, predicts the degree to which children would try to squeeze the ball in a way that uh, reflects their strength of belief in the property of the uh, yellow toy. Uh, the model basically computes the likelihood of seeing the observed data, uh, the three blue toys in the example, given different prior hypotheses about the properties of the blue and yellow toys, marginalized over different sampling assumptions that changes the probability of the observed data. Uh, I won't go into the details of the uh, model here. It's uh, pretty simple and it's uh, out in the paper. But what's more important than the model itself is that uh, we have a quantitative theoretical framework that allows people like me to go beyond just testing whether infants do X, uh, a binary conclusion about whether they do this. Uh, we can precisely manipulate the data that the baby see uh, in the ways that you see here. Uh, we are manipulating the proportion as well as the number of balls that we take out from the box uh, and measure how children's behavior changes and use these computational models to characterize the inference that generates these behaviors. So uh, these inferences uh, are quite remarkable and shows up even in uh, pre-verbal babies, but they manifest not only in the frequency of behaviors like squeezing those simple actions, but they also show up in the ways in which children explore more complex objects uh, like this toy over here. So in this study, children are introduced to a toy that they've never seen before. It looks really complex. And the observant adults pull out uh, this tube over here that makes, again, a squeaky sound. Uh, but some children saw it in a pedagogical context or uh, instructional context where the teacher was trying to say, hey, this is my toy. Let me show you how it works. Uh, in the other case, children saw them in a more incidental context, uh, accidentally discovering the function of the toy, even though children, again, across both conditions, saw pretty much same, the same thing in terms of the causal function of the toy. Uh, and what's interesting is that this toy actually had a few other hidden functions that children didn't know about. So the question was, how do children explore these toys, uh, this toy, after having seen the demonstration? And how does that differ depending on uh, the context that they've seen or the nature of these actions? So 
in the case of incidental action, uh, the one on the right, uh, you can see that the child is doing different things with the toy. She looks at different parts of the toy, she moves it over, listen to that uh, black tube. So she does a variety of actions. Uh, because she's wondering uh, what other parts do, uh, and she, so she uh, explores broadly, and she ends up discovering multiple, uh, mul uh, many of these hidden functions. However, in the in the other case, when the teacher declares that she knows about this toy, uh, what the child does. Um, because he does that for uh, probably like something like six minutes or something so he does that for a really long time but during that time he rarely uh, explores other parts of the toy and fails to discover these hidden functions again suggesting that children are actively exploring and doing actions and intervening on the world but the ways in which they explore the world can differ depending on the ways in which other people provided evidence or demonstrations. So how do children draw these inferences? Uh, children, again, like I said, uh, they have an internal working uh, model of the world, the physical world. There's basic understanding of objects, causal functions, and the principles that govern their behaviors. Uh, but they also have this other model, uh, a model of other minds, a basic understanding of other agents and the principles that govern their behaviors. And these, uh, this other model, it consists of not just uh, what you might be familiar with as a theory of mind, uh, the, the idea that humans or other agents have beliefs, desires, and goals, and they act according to these uh, mental representations, but also the idea that human, we see other agents as rational planners with uh, not just goals, beliefs, and desires, but also are driven to maximize their expected utilities. So this gives rise to things like principle of efficiency. We expect other people to go straight to uh, uh, the coffee shop instead of taking a long detour unless there's other compelling reasons to do so. And it's because we expect other people to act in a way that's consistent with uh, uh, an idea of max uh, utility maximizers or principle of efficiency. So this explains why uh, children thought that uh, the yellow toy uh, from here may not be squeaky because she must have wanted just the blue toys. Uh, otherwise, she would have selected other ones too. And in this toy too, she would have shown other parts of the toy if the toy had other functions. Uh, but because she didn't, it presumably means that the toy doesn't have anything else. So these kinds of principles can explain the reasons why children went beyond the evidence that's observable and made these uh, inferences about uh, the world with respect to what other people thought and what's in their minds. So if even, so you saw a few cases where even from the actions, children draw different inferences. Uh, and a, a lot of my uh, past and recent work has been trying to delineate this uh, space in terms of providing evidence for children's inferences, both as learners and as teachers. So they don't just learn uh, by imitating, but they draw inferences based on who did what and why, and they actively reason about the minds of others in the course of doing that. And they don't just uh, learn, but we learn because there is other people who uh, teach us about the world and children are already showing signatures of these uh, teaching behaviors. They consider what other people know, want and need. And it's just that it's not just that they always teach what's new, but they think about what other people know and want and need and they generate useful informative data that's tailored to their needs. So uh, social learning, uh, I hope you're convinced at this point that social learning is far uh, from something that just involves special mechanisms uh, like copying and imitation. Actually, a lot of it relies on the cognitive machinery that's also involved in individual learning, exploration, hypothesis testing. It's just that the data comes from the social world and 
uh, understanding evidence from social world uh, allows uh, requires a set of different understanding about other minds. So this is empowered by common sense social cognition, uh, internal model of others, as I suggested. It's also far from a passive mode of learning, as we typically think. Uh, learners actively consider the teacher's mind and modulate their exploration accordingly. And teachers actively consider the learner to teach and let the learners uh, uh, teach or even let the learners learn on their own. So I could uh, basically uh, say this is what we know about social learning and this is how humans learn from others and end the talk here. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to do today because in order for us to really get to the moon and we talk about uh, moonshot ideas or uh, North stars in order for us to guide us in terms of how to develop new systems that think and learn like humans, in order to get there, we need to go beyond just asking how we learn from others and how we help others learn because social learning is much more than that. So for instance, uh, go, just thinking beyond learning from others and teaching others, uh, we don't even, uh, what makes us want to learn from others in the first place? What makes children uh, pay attention to these behaviors and learn about the world? And what's making us want to teach others? Uh, what's driving us to show these behaviors to others, even at the expense of our own costs? And how do we learn to be with others? This is another important function of social learning that and this is something that we can only learn by interacting with others. How do we become humans that are able to interact and learn from humans? How do we learn to learn from others? So uh, there's a, a different, a different set of studies are really starting to speak to this idea that social learning is not just about learning about the world and, or teaching others about the world. It's uh, kind of learning to be social and learning to be humans. It's uh, about learning to become yourself too. And we do this, uh, uh, we can do this because we're curious, not just about the world, but we're also curious about other minds. We're curious about ourselves. And most importantly, we sort of know what to do about these curiosities and how best to resolve these curiosities. So uh, let me first uh, uh, start with a study that star starts to show uh, these behaviors. But maybe what I can do is just to briefly stop and see if there's any other, uh, other questions from the audience. Any question? People can unmute themselves. Uh, sure, I have one question. Uh, you, you, sure. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the teacher also needs to know about the generative model of the student, uh, right? Uh, when when in a when in a learning scenario, uh, teacher also needs mm -hmm. to know the student this way. But how? So when you say about the generative model, like there are two ways. Okay, uh, how exactly is the student building up the intuition about it, or is it how student is actually doing a task? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question again? So, so you mentioned so children that, do have a generative model of the other people's minds. That's uh, yes. something that I said in the talk. Uh, yeah. So, what it would what would it mean to uh, like communicate or know the generative model of the student by the teacher? Would it be through some task? Like they would see the task as how the child is performing, or is it through some? Oh, other you mean how do we learn? How do we learn those uh, generative models? Is that yeah. what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Right. So this is what's really hard about uh, uh, learning about this. So the a lot of the prior literature in cognitive development and cognitive science has been showing that there is already some a set of um, ideas about how the world works and how other people's minds work already at play. And what children need to do is to uh, use those models to uh, get more data and interpret those data in the most useful way to continue revising and updating their mo uh, model of the world. So it's, it's, it, what I was suggesting is not that they learn uh, from scratch these models. There's already a remarkably rich set of uh, uh, representations and uh, abilities to draw inferences that people have already found in very, very young infants. And the ways in which I alluded to social learning is 
the, the ways in which those uh, models become enriched and grows. And by generative model, I, what I mean is just an, an understanding of how other people's actions uh, are uh, emerging from a set of their unobservable variables, like their mental states, as well as their perceptions of the external world. Okay, so proceed forward. So here's uh, a way, uh, raise your hands. It's hard to see uh, most people here. So I'll just uh, just imagine the number of people who are raising their heads at the, uh, hands at the moment, but you might've been in this situation, just grabbing your head in front of your computer, trying to figure out what's happening here. And uh, as intentional agents, we carry out a bunch of goal-directed actions in our everyday lives. Uh, most of them are successful, but there's other times when we fail and we find ourselves wondering, you know, is there something about me uh, or is it something about the world? These are some of the fundamental questions that we have to ask ourselves. Uh, is the cause internal or external to ourselves? So what we were asking uh, in this uh, study that I'm about to show you is uh, how infants might be solving this, these problems uh, and how they might be solving it based on just a few observations of other people's actions. We didn't put them in front of a computer, but we uh, gave them this toy uh, that you can see over here. There's a button and the child is trying to press the button to make it go, uh, but it's not working and the child is frustrated. If the child has a reason to think, a reason to think that it's something about them, it's me, I'm the reason for my failure, then what they should do is to try to fix the object constant and change the agent. That's the basic principle of hypothesis testing. You uh, vary one variable at a time and the more likely we, uh, one to vary is to, uh, the more reasonable one to vary is the, uh, the agent. So you could give the toy to, for instance, your mom or your parent or somebody else next to you and see if they can do it. If you have a reason to think that it's the world, it's the object that's at fault, uh, then you should be fixing your self constant and try another toy. That is, go ahead, try, grab another one and explore that toy and see if that works. So in this study, what we've done is to uh, show children uh, uh, some demonstrations. So there were two experimenters taking turns in front of a child uh, trying to make this green toy go. Uh, but the uh, ways in which this demonstration happened is that the first person pressed the button and the toy made music. And the second, uh, but the second time uh, she tried it, the toy didn't work. Then the second person, experimenter two, took the toy press the button, didn't work. But the second time uh, E2 experimenter two tried it, the toy did make music. In the other condition, uh, what infants saw were pretty much the same, but just a little different. So here, still two experimenters taking turns, but E1 tried and the, made the toy go. E2 tried twice and made the toy, uh, wasn't able to make the toy go. E1 took the toy back uh, and was able to make the toy go. So twice, a uh, failure twice, success twice, uh, two different people, just the uh, different contingencies between who tried and who failed and succeeded. And what children got was actually this green toy to try for themselves. Uh, and there was another red toy uh, uh, next to them, but they couldn't reach. So they had to pull the cloth closer to try to retrieve the red toy. Uh, right next to them was their parent, uh, just sitting quietly observing them. And importantly, the toy never worked for the children. Uh, so they were really uh, uh, imitating those actions and doing what the people did, but it wasn't working for them. But if you are in the first case scenario, it strongly suggests that the toy is just flaky. It's unreliable, it goes half the time, doesn't go half the time. So the likely attribution is that it's probably because of the toy rather than myself. So uh, we expected children to reach for the red toy, trying to see if that would work instead of uh, asking for help. And this is what the child does. Oh, huh, let me try, okay? Let me try, watch this, stand a look. One, two, three, go. I'll try it one more time, okay? One, two, three, go! Stella, do you remember my toys? 
Do you know how many stories? I'm going to put this one right here, and I'm going to give this one to you. And you can go ahead and play. And you can see that the child uh, retrieves the toy after trying it a few times and also tries the red toy. However, uh, in the next case scenario, uh, very similar evidence, uh, same failures that children experience or infants experience, but the evidence here strongly suggests that some people can do uh, and other people cannot do uh, because E1 was always able to make the toy go, whereas E2 was unable to make the toy go. So if children fail, uh, the likely attribution is that, oh, it's probably me. Uh, so this is what the child does uh, in these uh, cases. So we're done with the demonstration. The child tries the green toy, presses it a few times, and she hands it over to her dad. We instructed parents to not respond or don't press the toy, uh, the button on the toy. The father is clearly resisting the urge to go ahead and help. But instead of trying the other toy, she repeatedly seeks help. So even as young as 16 month old, uh, infants are using these minimal covariation data that's embedded in other people's actions. And they infer the cause of their own failures. And when their actions are ineffective, uh, that's when they seek help. So it's not that they're indiscriminately copying others' actions or always looking to seek help or always exploring. They're judging the relative utility of these different kinds of actions and they're flexibly exploring other toys or seeking help depending on whether their actions are effective. Now, this is children themselves failing, but what do we do when somebody else fails? You may be uh, familiar with this kind uh, with uh, this Felix Wernicken and Michael Tomasello's uh, famous work here. Here's an infant uh, recognizing that this person wants to open the cabinet but can't, but in opening the door for them. It's a very lovely, cute video that uh, makes everyone smile. Uh, however, as even though these behaviors are really remarkable, actually helping in the real world is even harder because it's not always as straightforward as opening up a cabinet. Uh, there's a clear path forward in terms of what's blocking the person and uh, what, how you, what you should do in order to help this person. But in often cases, oftentimes in real world situations, uh, we kind of need to figure out how to help it. It's not totally clear from the ways in which uh, we, uh, not totally clear from our environment. So here's a case where uh, there's an, a toddler, uh, just about 20 month old. There's two identical looking toys in front of the child and the child just played uh, with them for about a minute or so, uh, not that long of an experience, uh, but they look identical. One works and the other is broken and the parent has no clue why they're failing and he's going to be asking for help. And the toddler has to figure out what to do in this situation. Hi, Leo. Let's take a look. No. No. I'm gonna try this toy. Can you help me play music? Go ahead, Leo. Could you help your dad play music? What just happened here? Uh, infants, when they themselves fail, they consider whether it's me or the world and decides what to do accordingly. Uh, in this situation, when children were already knowable, uh, knowledgeable about some uh, the, how the toys work, but perceptually they have no idea too because they don't know which one is which, but they look at the parent's failure and understand that, oh, he's working on the broken toy, so it must be the world. And what the child does is to lead the parent to the other toy. Uh, and in the other condition that I haven't shown you in the video, uh, there's a hidden button 
uh, behind the in the back of the toy and the parent is trying to press the wrong button and that's why he's failing. So when it's clear that it's the agent uh, that is the cause of the failure, they intervene in a different way. Instead of uh, going to the other object, they flip over the toy that the parent just tried and show the other button uh, in order to inform the parent. So depending on, again, the cause of other people's failures, uh, when children already know something about the world, they're incredibly motivated to just go ahead and do something for them. But it's not always doing uh, whatever the parent did, because otherwise they would be always pressing the same button that the parent pressed. But depending on what they know and depending on why they fail, they uh, help others in different ways. Sometimes you flip it over to show the button. Other times you go over to the broken toy and uh, you go over to the working toy to show which one works. So children are already thinking about whether it's me or the world, should I explore or should I seek help? Uh, children are also are able to understand or think about why are you struggling? What can I do for you? Uh, these are ways in which they respond to their own or other people's failures by reasoning retrospectively. Uh, but one of the signatures of human teaching is that we just don't wait for other people to fail. Uh, we prevent failures by preemptively reasoning prospectively to uh, help other people avoid these consequences. So imagine you were stranded in an, on an island and you tried really, really hard to make fire. When you finally made fire, uh, but you also run into this person who uh, is also stranded and doesn't know how to make fire, you would really wanna show them uh, how to make uh, that happen because you understand that this person will struggle to learn this on their own. So the question we're asking in the study is, do uh, children selectively teach what maximizes other people's utility, the learner's utility in this case. So it's not that the child is trying to maximize their own utility or expect other people to maximize their own utility, but they themselves as teachers are thinking about the other person's utility and trying to maximize that in a pro-social way. So uh, if that's the case, they should be teaching information that saves others trouble and teach information that benefits others. So this is work by Sophie Bridgers uh, and Julia Hara Ettinger. Uh, Sophie Bridgers is a student who just defended and is actually working with Tomer Allman uh, and Laura Schultz at Harvard and MIT. Uh, Julian Hara Ettinger is an uh, assistant professor at Yale currently. Uh, so these, uh, what we did is to uh, create some toys. Again, uh, what we do typically to study children is to design these toys and put them into experimental situations. Uh, what, he, what we did is to uh, design uh, two different toys. One uh, toy is what we call the low reward, low cost toy, because the toy only has one button. Uh, it's really easy to learn how to make it go. And when it goes, uh, it plays music that is uh, considered not as rewarding, still sort of rewarding, but not as rewarding as this other toy. So this other toy, you have to uh, press exactly these two buttons at the same time, and there's multiple buttons on the toy. So it's really hard to figure out exactly how this goes, uh, how to make this work if you didn't know anything about this toy. Uh, but when you do make it work, uh, it has this cool globe that uh, brightens up and spins around and it's uh, children consider it really high reward. So what we did is to let children play with these toys first, uh, then we made sure that they understand and they can even demonstrate that to us. And the key question was uh, to ask children, hey, I have a friend who's going to play with these toys all by, my, uh, all by herself. Which toy should I teach my friend? So this is a decision to teach one and let the learner explore the other one. And the question is, which one do they choose? So you can think of this as a choice between two different teaching plans uh, with different utilities. So let's say the uh, toy uh, at, the, uh, at the top is the toy X. The utility of teaching this toy uh, is uh, a combination of the utility of activating the chosen toy, uh, because if you're instructed how it works, then uh, it's really easy to activate it. And then you have to discover 
uh, the learner has to discover how to make the toy go. So this increases the cost quite a lot. Uh, this, this has a very high cost and the learner has to struggle a lot to probably uh, figure out how this works. However, uh, the utility of teaching uh, the lower toy, the uh, toy Y, the high reward, high cost toy, uh, if you teach this toy, then the learner will learn really easily how to make this toy go and retrieve the high reward from the toy. And uh, if the learner has to, uh, the learner has to explore the toy at the top, which is the low reward, low cost toy, but it's really easy to learn. So the learner would presumably succeed and learn uh, how this toy works. So in this case, it's clearly uh, more reasonable to try to teach the toy at the bottom um, and that's what our model uh, predicts, as I'll show you in a second. But instead of just testing what children do in, these, in this overdetermined case, what we did was to design a few different sets of toys and see what children do across these conditions. So uh, another pair was comparing low re reward, to low cost toy against low reward, high cost toy. So reward is the same, cost is different. Uh, another set of toys uh, was we fixed one toy to high reward, low cost, and we compare the toy against the choice for uh, different toys that uh, were all low reward, but varied in terms of the cost. So you should be seeing different degrees to which children choose to teach this toy over the other one uh, across conditions. So this is what uh, our model predicts based on uh, the relative utility of different teaching plans. And I'll show you the behavioral data from uh, 25 children in each one of these bars. And this is what we see, uh, 24 children, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but you can see that children's behaviors uh, that is choice for the toys to teach really closely tracks uh, what the model predicts, which means children are not just thinking about what's rewarding or what's costly, they consider both variables at the same time, combines them into an integra integrated notion of utility and makes choices accordingly. So what's cool about this study is that learners, it, said, it suggests learners can't discover everything uh, because there's just too much to learn, uh, but also teachers can't and perhaps shouldn't teach everything because there's too much to teach and you can't always be teaching, you have to do other things too. So teachers need to smartly uh, prioritize what needs to be taught uh, and teach what's difficult to learn and let the learners figure out the rest. So utility-based reasoning can function as a basis for teaching uh, and accumulation of useful evidence. But you might be wondering, uh, how do we even know what's hard or easy? Do we always need to actually struggle ourselves and experience that difficulty ourselves? Uh, if so, then we're in trouble because if we're learning from others, we can learn things without going through the struggles. But if we can't prioritize teaching that for other people, then uh, we would be, uh, again, uh, being unable to choose what's useful for other people. So we need to be able to tell oftentimes what's hard or easy, even before being able to experience uh, the actual struggles or difficulties of doing a task. So uh, in this study, uh, in, a, in a set of studies, what we're looking at is how children make decisions about which one's harder. A very simple task where we ask, uh, I have a friend, uh, I have two friends, Sally and Anne here. Uh, Sally made these uh, line uh, of uh, 10 blocks, whereas uh, Anne made this tower of 10 blocks. They both worked with 10 blocks, but which one is harder to make? Which one is harder to make? Left or right? You might be thinking probably the one on the right. And these judgments are easy. These judgments don't take long, uh, but you may be answering, oh, the tower is harder to make because you have to align the corners better for it to not make it fall. Uh, and if, you, if it falls down, then you have to do some of these actions all over again. Uh, so these in, uh, judgments are really intuitive, uh, yet they're incredibly important for many real world decisions because thinking through what's hard and easy and why they're hard and easy uh, must be made before we engage in the task. So uh, we've been thinking of these block paradigms, uh, block building paradigms. This might be familiar to you as a domain to train and uh, test robots, but it also provides us cognitive scientists to, uh, as a great test bed for us to manipulate various things that influence difficulty of these uh, 
uh, uh, block structures and try to understand how and whether children are able to judge the relative difficulty of different kinds of uh, block structures. So what we have been finding is that even just from looking at the initial and the final states, no information about the intermediate states, what they can do is to reason through the process of building these blocks and they can choose which one is harder to build. Uh, they're well above chance, especially some of the simpler trials. They struggle with other uh, complex trials, uh, which I won't go into more detail currently uh, right now, but feel free to ask me later. And what's remarkable is that uh, this is uh, again, data collected uh, in collaboration with Julian Har Ettinger's lab from uh, Bolivian uh, people in Bolivian villages, uh, Chimani. These children had ne no experience with blocks ever. They've never seen these blocks, but nonetheless, they can look at these photos, construe them as agents interacting with objects in the physical world, and consider the process of building them and uh, uh, confidently choose which one is harder or easier. So it says some, and, and in addition to understanding which one's harder or easier, uh, the point of making these judgments is that we wanna use it for further decision-making such as which one should I make? Or if I have a friend who's building an easier one and another friend who's building a harder one, which one should I help given that I can only choose to uh, help one of the two? So a lot of these decisions about uh, self uh, goal directed actions, as well as collaborative decisions, we really need to uh, consider uh, what others can do and what's harder or easy for them. And these studies are beginning to show us uh, the ways in which children might be uh, already thinking about these in a very abstract way. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'll just go very quickly through some of the final things and uh, try to make a more broader point about social learning. So all of the things that I've shown you so far uh, consider, uh, involves thinking about the physical world uh, or learning about the physical world from other people. However, uh, one of the most important things that children have to learn uh, is about themselves and also, what we're curious about is, what do you think of me? Do you think I can do this? And if you have a false belief about my own competence, then I want to change your mind. So take a look at this video uh, and uh, you'll probably figure out what's going on. This is what we call the asking condition. Uh, so Ethan, we're gonna play with these toys today. And sometimes my friend Anne will watch you play. Does that sound okay? Yes. Okay. And you know what? I think Anne's ready to watch us play now. Hey Anne, is that you? Hi. Hi Anne. So Anne comes in. And then uh, the child observes as the demonstrator, the experimenter shows how the toy works. Okay. But when okay. the child tries. I knew tries... it because my favorite color is red. Because your favorite color is red? Okay. All right, are you ready to see what this toy can do? Okay. One, two, three, go. Make noise. Wow, that's really cool. That toy makes music. Okay, now you can try. One, two, three, go. Hmm. Okay, let me try again, okay? So what happens in this video is that uh, the uh, experimenter succeeds twice while the child uh, fails twice in front of this Anne who is observing as the event unfolds. And the child is reasonably flustered, uh, the child is confused. Uh, and what happens later in the task is that she leaves the room uh, and just before the child finally succeeds, uh, to uh, make make the toy. Try again. Yeah. Okay. One last time. One, One two, time. three. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. And here's a child looking. <laughs> and the question we had for this child is: there was another toy, green toy, that the child uh, also learned how to work. And uh, this toy is something that uh, the ant has never seen. And what the cho uh, what the ch children ended up doing is even though they could easily have chosen the green toy that she's never seen before, because Anne falsely thought 
that the child can't make the toy go because she just left the road. She left the room just before the child finally succeeded. They chose to show the red toy, even though Anne already saw, the, saw these toys a few times because they wanted to communicate that, hey, you think I can't do it. Uh, I actually can do it. Suggesting that children can infer what Anne thinks about the self uh, in much the same way that they uh, can reason about uh, other minds in uh, cases that I showed you earlier, they care about what she thinks and they want to correct and revise what they, uh, she thinks. And they actually chose the right evidence to show her to correct that belief. So what does this mean uh, for us to be thinking about social learning? Learning to be social, uh, uh, social learning is not just about learning from others about the world, but it's learning to be social and learning to be human. Because human intelligence means so much more than knowing a lot or solving prescribed problems. Uh, we know how to use our intelligence uh, and we use it for ourselves and we use it for other people. And what I showed you today is that even young children know when to rely on others. They help others solve others' problems, uh, anticipate others' trouble and offer help proactively, care about what others think of the self and communicate about the self. And although I didn't get to show you today, uh, Yang Wu, who's in uh, my lab as a postdoc, is working on really interesting, cool studies on how infants are harnessing other people's emotional expressions uh, as information to learn about the world. So uh, human learning is not uh, just uh, learning, but it's learning in the social context. Learning happens uh, rather than uh, the top picture, it happens more like this, and it happens more like this. Uh, there's a child who's running around the room, sometimes going to the toys and sometimes going to their parents or grandparents and people around them. And what children have is not just curiosity about the physical world, but the curiosity about their social world is really driving how they interact with others and how they interact with objects too, uh, and how they learn to cooperate with others. And these uh, uh, curiosities are really what I think is the driver for these intelligent behaviors that I showed you. So what does this mean uh, and why should we care? Computer vision, machine learning, AI, and robotics, there's uh, so many different progresses that are, that are uh, and uh, the development of AI has been really a fast paced uh, field. And we know that there are a lot of algorithms that are really capable of recognizing, labeling objects or people and even emotion expressions. They perform tasks and games with clear end states and goals. They can predict future states and learn from errors. And they do outperform humans on these kinds of tasks. They definitely do. But do they observe, generalize, explain, and communicate with others in ways that young children, children do? Not quite yet. Uh, do they learn about the self, learn about others, help others learn in a way that allows them to interact smoothly, sm intelligently in social environments? Not quite yet. So uh, I'm fortunate to be a member of a uh, participant of the uh, Human-Centered uh, AI uh, um, Institute at Stanford University. Uh, it's been really exciting to start collaborating with people uh, who are also participants in this endeavor, uh, including Fei-Fei Li and her colleagues and James Landay and uh, their students too. And we talk about cognitive North Star. What should AI look towards? Uh, to human behaviors as the guiding star or guiding light. And what I want to stress at the end of this talk today is that it's not just about the behaviors. The behaviors that you see are the products of what's going on inside the minds. The real North Star is not what humans do, but how humans do it. And it's not that us cognitive scientists uh, have the answer, we still don't know, and that's why we have still work to do, uh, but we have some clues. There's key representations and inferential processes that seems to be at work, whether we're alone or whether we're interacting with others. And there's properties of objects and properties of agents that seem to be present even in babies' minds. And many of you might be excited about intuitive physics and how to uh, uh, get that inspiration from uh, young children's behaviors to uh, use it to uh, build better machines that are understanding our physical scenes. But what's the next new frontier? I really think social cognition, communication, and social learning uh, is what uh, where the uh, the, the really um, the guiding north star uh, uh, is. 
So with that, uh, I'll just uh, uh, thank uh, collaborators and my lab members and uh, take any questions if I have uh, any time left. Thanks, Xiao. Uh, people can raise their hand. The question, uh, unmute themselves. Uh, hi, Professor, I had a question. Hi, yes. Right, so just to go back to the earlier slide where we saw that uh, the child who was instructed that instructed by a person who knew uh, the ways in which the toy could operate, sort of just mm -hmm. operated it in one in way this one? and did not explore. Yeah, this one, right. But the other one who wasn't told anything earlier, uh, like before she got to try the toy herself, she sort of mm -hmm. had the curiosity and she uh, was willing to explore. So then I started thinking about whether uh, learning in social context over here sort of hinders the curiosity and eventually the learning as well for this child. Uh, so like, so, so, I mean, so how do we draw the line over there or, or do we like, or in children specifically, like do they draw the line in between where to stop curiosity and, you know, like just put your blind belief in that the other, what the other person is doing is absolutely Yes. Correct. Like, so, I mean, how, I, how, how does that trade off work? Yeah, that's a really great question. And actually this uh, paper that came out in 2011, uh, precisely for that reason, it was titled uh, the double-edged sword of pedagogy. The idea being that sometimes uh, social learning is great because this child really learned about the squeaker, uh, but as a consequence, the, it reduced the uh, exploration, the scope of exploration and the child, it basically hindered learning in some sense. However, uh, it's easy to think about it that way because we, pre uh, we uh, deliberately produced a environment in which the child was misled by this teacher who clearly uh, omitted things that are really, really important. So some of the follow-up work, uh, so in this case, in typically what a good teacher should do in these cases is I know about this toy, let me show you how it works. Uh, and it also does other interesting things and let the learner know that there are interesting things to find. So we deliberately created this situation in order to test whether children would draw that strong inference when the evidence is clearly uh, instructional. And we use these hidden functions and the ways in which they discover as a way to demonstrate how strong the evidence is. It's really compelling because children were failing to discover these things by, uh, because they were making the right kind of inference. However, in real life, uh, good teachers should really never do this. They should point to the learners that there may be some other interesting things to discover. And what we have done in some uh, follow-up work is that when children actually have uh, a sense of uh, how many things that the toy can do, when they see a teacher like the one on the left, the one that shows only one thing but doesn't show the rest, children understand that, hey, this teacher actually omitted really important information. And they rate the teacher as less helpful than a teacher who shows the same thing, uh, but uh, you know, on a toy that doesn't have anything else which means that they're understanding how informative a person's uh, evidence is about learning about this causal structure. And they even uh, modulate their inferences accordingly when they learn the next time. Oh, you omitted some information last time. Well, I'm going to uh, suspend drawing strong inferences from your behavior uh, because I don't trust you to be a good mm -hmm. teacher. So children's inference mechanisms are not only uh, sometimes they can fool them into showing these behaviors, but they actually are also protecting them against bad, uh, uh, uninformative pedagogy because they can look beyond uh, their behaviors and try to draw the right inferences when they have the appropriate prior knowledge. Right. So that was a great answer. Thank you so much. Maybe time for one last question. Okay, uh, maybe I, I'll, I'll ask the last question in that case. Uh, here, one thing which I've been wondering, what is the role of environment in conducting studies? Let's say if we go out in playground and provide children VS uh, to a lab kind of scenario, would the inferences be something different or would they be same? 
You mean in what kind of context? Say, say we have to conduct studies about how children interact with toys. Now, mm -hmm. if you go out in a scenario like a playground kind of scenario or mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a very relaxed or chill scenario that the child would like. To, right. Uh, and let's say the child is not aware that somebody is recording them. Would the inferences be different? Uh, over oh, interesting. As compared to let, so let's say a, mm -hmm. a child being, uh, being observed in a particular scenario in a lab setup. Right, so that's a, that's a few different uh, great questions embedded in there. Uh, as, so a lot of the experiments that we do, most of actually all of the experiments we do are really in precisely controlled settings. In this case, they're mostly aware that they are being observed because we know that uh, they, they know that they're being videotaped uh, and we, they were, they're also clearly not in playgrounds where there's many interesting things happening, many other people playing around and interesting cool objects that they've never seen before. Uh, however, uh, if I'm pressed to answer, I would say some, still similar mechanisms at work, but uh, behaviors may look differently because of those uh, extra variables. That again, just like you saw in the case of the child who really wanted uh, the other person to know that they can do something, when children are clearly aware that they're being observed or they're being evaluated, they might be thinking about uh, the reasons for uh, trying to make sure that other people know that they can do something. And if they fail, and if they know that they're being observed, then that might have different implications for their next behaviors as opposed to when they're failing, when nobody else is observing. Similarly, uh, we're giving them just one or two toys to choose from or explore. When there's multiple other things happening around them, of course, they may be thinking that they, there may be something interesting happening around uh, other things too. They may seem like they're easily distracted, but the distraction may actually be something that's coming from a pretty rational standpoint that, ooh, I have this thing, but there may be other interesting things to explore too, so maybe I'll go ahead and do that. That doesn't mean that children are always uh, perfectly rational, uh, just like humans, uh, just like adults. Uh, there's still many things that we still do not understand uh, from this framework, but this allows us to understand noisy, uh, seemingly noisy, seemingly uh, random behaviors of children and uh, allow us to look underneath them to try to figure out exactly what kinds of inferences and represent representations are underlying uh, their behavior. So uh, this experimental method has its own limitations in that it cannot be directly generalized to other contexts, but it's very useful for us to uh, test hypotheses about the human mind uh, in these young minds. I see. All right. No more question. Let's thank the speaker. Thanks, Joe. Thanks once again. Thank you so much. Spending time with us. Thank you, Professor. Sure. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure and I hope to see you soon. Thanks.